from Karakoram were headed south toward the Gobi. But first we're stopping at the Shank Monastery outside Karakoram. The young monks are blowing the conch shells to announce the morning service. Founded in 1647, Shank is one of Mongolia's oldest and most historically significant monasteries. The main temple was built between 1710 and 1790. At its height, the monastery included several schools and consisted of 20 buildings and housed over 1,500 monks. In the 1937 communist purges, the monastery was closed and most of its buildings were destroyed. Many of the monks were executed or sent to labor camps in Siberia. The main temple escaped major damage and was used as a warehouse. Fortunately, most of the monastery's precious relics were removed and hidden by a young novice monk who was allowed to return to his family. After the 1990 democratic revolution, monks returned to Shank and started restoration. We're headed to another monastery, Anji, in Dungovi province, which translates to Middle Gobi. It seems more appropriate to call it a track than a road through the steppe. Animal husbandry and livestock products such as wool and cashmere are the main industry in Dungovi province. And vultures clean up the roadkill and other carcasses. We must be getting close to the Gobi. We're starting to see herds of Bactrian camels. We have arrived at our destination, Secret of Anji Resort, with all the comforts of home except for a private bathroom. But we settle into our gear. We enjoy a late lunch at the Gear Camps restaurant. Then we go exploring in the golden hours for photography. The Anji River made this a stop for the camel caravans on the Silk Road. The monastery here was founded in 1660. At its peak, it was one of the largest monasteries in Mongolia. The older southern complex had 11 temples, and the 18th century northern complex consisted of 17 temples. Both complexes were completely destroyed in the purges of 1939. Over 200 monks were killed, and the rest were imprisoned or conscripted into the army. In the 1990s, efforts began to rebuild the monastery. The first temple was inaugurated in 2004. This stupa has been reconstructed and has a commemorative plaque including the names of the monks who died in 1939. The water attracts birds to this area. And the late afternoon light makes for great photography. Then it's back to our gear to get cleaned up before dinner. This morning we're headed into the heart of the Gobi. The first part of our journey winds through granite outcroppings. We stop at Bulgan to top up our tanks. I expect the opportunities will be few and far between from now on. The sparse vegetation in the flat steppe are more how I envisioned the Gobi. We make a rest stop on the side of a small hill. From the top, you can see the Gobi steppe is punctuated by these rocky crests. Lizards are well suited to this ecosystem. Humans have lived in the Gobi for thousands of years. These petroglyphs have never been dated. We're off again into the flat steppe. It may look dry and doesn't get much rain, but there is an aquifer underneath the sandy soil. People come for miles to fill up their water tank from this hand-dug well. The horses are attracted by the human activity and get their share as well. We have arrived at our home for two nights. Our little log house on the step with a bathroom. Then we're off again to the Canorgan Ells, or Singing Sands. 
This range of sand dunes is four to seven miles wide and 62 miles long. The highest dunes are over 260 feet. The sand makes sounds as it's moved by the wind, hence the name Singing Sands. A passing herd of camels makes for great pictures. Finally, the sun sets behind the dunes and we call it a day. We head back towards the Canorgan Elves this morning. We're exploring this orange sandstone mesa. We can get up close to the flora and fauna that survives in this harsh environment. We give this chive-like allium a taste test, not bad. Our intrepid leaders encourage us to climb to the top. We still have a ways to go. Hard to guess how old this Soxall tree was or how long it's been dead. The strong winds moves rocks up against the seams in the sandstone. Still more to go. Finally, the view from the top. There must be water here occasionally, judging from the erosion. There are even a few birds on the mesa. The contorted trunk of an old Saxol tree. And lots of lizards. Overhead is a flight of Demoiselle cranes headed to India. Back at camp, we have car problems. After lunch, we're out exploring an area near the dunes where water is near the surface. The vegetation is lush by comparison. There's even an oasis of standing water. And that attracts birds. We get the rare sight of a lammergeier. A vulture with an unusual diet. It eats almost exclusively bone. Yesterday, we commented on this isolated settlement of gears and what it was like to live here. Well, we're going to drop in for a visit and find out. Our hostess answers our strange questions and feeds us Mongolian treats. Then her husband gives us camel rides. And then it's back to the dunes. They call this area the Saxol Forest. The tough, salt-tolerant Saxol bush is as close as you get to a tree here. And the camels keep them well pruned. We follow the camel tracks toward the dunes. Wolfgang and Gerald have made some special arrangements for a photo shoot. Wolfgang directs our models up one side of the dune and then down the other and then do it all over again. We get some great pictures, but I wonder what the camel herder is thinking, let alone the camels. Get the camel silhouetted against the setting sun, and it's time for dinner. After breakfast, we drive to the flaming cliffs. We drop our bags at our gear and have lunch. Now we're ready to search for dinosaur fossils. This place was made famous by Roy Chapman Andrews and his Central Asiatic Expeditions of 1920 to 28. Near here, his expedition found the first ever dinosaur eggs. So now we're seeing if we can be so lucky. Are these bones or rocks? Roy Chapman Andrews named this place the Flaming Cliffs because of the red-orange color of the sandstone cliffs, especially at sunset. We explore the top of the cliffs for a while.
and then position ourselves for the iconic shot of the sunset. It hasn't changed that much in a hundred years. Then it's sunset and the flaming cliffs don't disappoint. Then back to camp and dinner. We're up at sunrise this morning for an early breakfast. We're driving back to Ulaanbaatar today. It'll take at least eight hours. 